What the Bible says to us is rejoice in the Lord because there is a far greater reality than the reality of your problems. That's spiritual worship. Living your life in such a way that those who know you can see that Jesus is your treasure. He is what you ascribe worth to. The things that come out of your mouth show that. The, the things that you do for others show that. The sacrifices you might make for loved ones show that. The sacrifices you might make for strangers show that. That Jesus is our treasure. So if that's what worship is, why do we call this worship? What are we doing here? What we do here is this. We come together as God's people for two reasons. One, because it's commanded. Hebrews 10 verse 25 commands us to come together regularly as God's people. But when we come together as God's people, here's what we're doing. We are feeding our appetites. You know how you feed an appetite? You know what happens when you feed an appetite? When you feed an appetite, that appetite grows. If you want to starve out an appetite, then don't feed it, right? So, so for example, if, if I want to increase my appetite for steak, I would feed my appetite steak. I wouldn't deny myself steak because eventually I would lose my appetite for it. But if I want to increase my appetite for steak, I would feed myself steak. Now, there's a limit to that because we live in a fallen world and as good as steak may be, steak is also fallen. Just like my appetite is fallen. So there's a point at which I can overfeed my, my appetite on something and then it goes the other way. I can get tired of it. I can get sick of it. Okay, But we're talking about spiritual appetites here. We feed our spiritual appetites here with Jesus. And Jesus is perfect. Jesus is sinless. And so therefore we cannot overfeed ourselves on Jesus. So the more we come together and feed ourselves on Jesus, the more that increases our spiritual appetite for Jesus, which equips us, Ephesians 4, equips us to go out into the world and live in such a way that treasures Him because we have fed our appetite for Him and increased our appetite for Him. Therefore, we can go out into the world and others can see us and they can see that we have an appetite for Jesus. That's what, that's what we're doing here. We're gorging ourselves on Jesus. So that that appetite for Him, that spiritual appetite for Him, will grow, will strengthen, will be nurtured, will increase. And then we go out into the world and people see us and they see us worshiping. Not to mean that they see us singing or praying, but they see us living our life and making decisions and making choices and saying things that show people Jesus is their treasure. That's what worship is. That's worship by the Spirit. That's, that is, can only be done by the Spirit. And that is the Scriptures teach us basically what encompasses all of life here on earth. For the believer in Jesus Christ, that is what life on earth is, is spiritual worship. Look at what Jesus said. To flip back real quick, you don't, well, you don't have to, but you can just listen, or if you're still in John 4, here's what Jesus said. You worship what you don't know, we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. True worshipers. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. That's why, that's why God saved you. Do you know that? God wants worshipers. Not because His ego has to be propped up. Not because he's, uh, His self-esteem is struggling and He needs some people to sort of praise Him. God is seeking worshipers because He is the perfect divine being that is infinitely worthy of praise. And so therefore, it is infinitely right that He be praised. And because He created His universe to be right, He is seeking people to worship Him because that is the most right thing that can be done. So God saved you to, to worship Him. God saved all of us to be worshipers. We uh, make disciples of ourselves to make worshipers. We make disciples of one another to be worshipers. We seek to make disciples of lost people to be worshipers. Winston Smith said, all of our problems, all of the problems in life really are a worship problem. And I think he's on to something here. 
basically all of, all of your problems in life, all of your interpersonal struggles, all the frictions in life, all of them at their very root are a worship problem. And here's why. Because when we don't treasure Christ above everything, our relationships will break down. Our actions will begin to break down. The things that we desire will begin to break down. So if there is a, a marital struggle, that, that means that one or both of those marital partners are not treasuring Jesus above all things. If there is an interpersonal problem with somebody at work, that means Jesus Christ is not being valued. So in a sense, all of the problems of life stem from a problem of worship. This is why Jesus was so emphatic. True worshipers is what the Father is seeking, who worship in spirit and in truth. That's why Jesus, or that's why Paul made such a point. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's your spiritual worship. Okay? So that's the idea of spiritual worship. Corporate worship is here to feed our appetite for Jesus so that we go into the world hungry for Him, showing people His treasure, that He is our treasure. So that's the, that's the first thing. We spent the most time on that. We'll see that the other two just sort of follow along in that same vein of thought. The second thing he says is that not only do they worship by the Spirit of God, but they glory in Christ Jesus. Glory in Christ Jesus. That word glory is one of Paul's favorites. That word shows up some uh, 37 times in our New Testament. Of those 37 times, 35 of them are by Paul. The rest of the New Testament writers combined to make up the other two. Paul likes this word. He likes the idea of glory. He likes the concept and he refers to it often. What the word literally means is, is a verbal praise or a verbal affirmation that this is the thing that I am most proud of. That's, that's what he means by glory or boast in or, uh, or verbal praise. It, it, glory is not something that's done silently. It's verbal. Okay. So we see how this ties in with the idea of worship by the Spirit. Because worshiping by the Spirit will often mean that things come out of our mouth that glory in Christ Jesus because the things coming out of our mouth are going to show Him as our treasure. So He uses this word frequently. Often He uses it in, in a bad sense to say, you know, the, uh, in fact, in chapter 4, He's going to say, they glory in their bellies, uh, speaking of the, the enemies to the gospel. But he's, uh, he's often going to use it in, a sen- in the sense that our glory, like his, uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter um, 1, verse 31. Let he who boasts, boast in the Lord. Okay. So the idea here is that Paul says it's, it's crucial, it's very important that what comes out of the mouth of the true Christian is that verbal affirmation that this is the thing that I am most proud of, this is the thing that's most treasured, this is the thing in which I delight in, this is my boast. It's sort of this this verbal affirmation of what Jesus would mean to us, to verbally praise something. Look at uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verses, verse 15. Through Him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of the lips, that acknowledge His name. The fruit of the lips of the true believer are this sacrificial praise to God, and they're this sacrificial praise to God because they acknowledge His name. Now listen to Jeremiah chapter 9. This is not in your notes, but you can just listen. Jeremiah chapter 9, here's what Jeremiah says. He says in verse 23, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the the wise man say things that, that show that his wisdom is what he's most proud of. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. So there's once again the idea of the circumcision of the heart. Okay, So this idea that Jeremiah says, or God is speaking through Jeremiah, and he says, let not the people that I've created boast or glory in manly things, in earthly things, in humanly things, riches or wisdom or power or whatever. 
Let not that be your boast, but if you're going to boast, if you're going to open your mouth and, and, and declare, this is what I'm most proud of, this is what I delight in most, let that be that you know me. What's Paul going to say a little bit later? You see how all this ties in together? He says, verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. All these thoughts are just tying right in together. So Paul says that the true Christian, the genuine Christian, worships by the Spirit of God. Not something we can manufacture. God's Spirit does it in us. Number two, what comes out of their mouth is boasting or glorying or praising, magnifying the Lord. Thirdly, he's going to say, and put no confidence in the flesh. We'll sort of touch on this one briefly because from this point, Paul is going to go into this long explanation of confidence in the, in the flesh. He just warned the, the Philippians that you, you cannot add to the gospel of grace this, this work of the flesh, this circumcision thing. You can't do that. That's going to steal your joy. That's going to cripple your joy. You can't do that. Instead, put no confidence in the flesh. And from verse 4 onward, he's going to say, now this, this trusting in the flesh, by the way, when the New Testament talks about flesh, what it means is human ability or fallen human power. Okay, So Paul's going to go on from here to say, if this trusting in human ability, if there was anything to it, then I would have been at the front of the pack. Because Paul's not saying, you know, I'm saying to you Philippians, don't trust in, in your works because, you know, it didn't work out for me. And, you know, I just, I just didn't really have a whole lot going for me. And I was, you know, so I chose a different path. That's not what Paul's saying at all. He's saying if anybody could be saved by the flesh, it would have been me. Hebrew of Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if it didn't work for me, Paul says there's no way it's going to work for you. So just to touch base on this confidence in the flesh, it's a, it's a trust sort of bleeds right over into this idea of boasting in the Lord. Remember how Jeremiah talks about let him who boasts, boasts in me. Don't you hear in all the things that God was saying through Jeremiah, don't you hear this element of trust and confidence? Let him who boasts, boasts in me. Don't, bust, don't boast in your riches. Don't boast in your power. Don't boast in your strength. Let he who boasts, boasts in me. You hear it in there. This, there's not just a delight. There's not just a pride. But there's also a trust. There's a confidence. And so that carries right over into this confidence in the flesh. Again, Paul knows if you put any confidence in who you are, what you have done, in some prior experience with God, or some conversion moment, or some... A uh, certificate you signed when you were eight years old or, or uh, that time when you got wet in church when you were nine years old or whatever it may be, if you put any confidence in those things, you will have no joy. Your joy will eventually evaporate because whatever confidence you put in what you did, that confidence will be undermined because it is, as Jesus says elsewhere, that's like a house built on sand. Okay? So, Here's the, here's the concluding thought. We'll wrap it all up with this. Paul is writing to the Philippians. And his command to them is be joyful. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, if we think about the Philippians, let's remind ourselves not to have this picture in our mind of these people that were part of this church in Philippi and they were, they were affluent, sort of movers and shakers of the Philippian city and the go-getters, and they sort of had everything going for them. The Philippian church, Paul's going to write to the Corinthians, and he's going to use them as an example of people that give to the work of the church out of poverty. He's going to say that they were they donated, there was this famine, and they were collecting money for the, for the people who didn't have food, and the Philippian Christians gave more than anybody else. And Paul says they are a prime example of people who gave out of extreme poverty. So the Philippian Christians are not the silver spoon people. They're not the people who hold the positions in society. They are marginalized. They are persecuted. They are outcasts. And he says to these Philippian Christians, rejoice. But don't you love how the Bible never says to the Philippians or to us or to anybody, it never says to us, rejoice in the Lord because your problems really aren't that many. 
The Bible never says to us, rejoice in the Lord because these other problems in your life really are are not very significant. The Bible never minimizes the circumstances of our life that fight against joy. Instead, what the Bible says to us is, rejoice in the Lord because there is a far greater reality than the reality of your problems. There's a far greater truth than the truth of your, of your life right now and the things that you face right now. And because there is a greater reality, that greater reality can overshadow the negative realities of your life now and you can rejoice in the Lord. That's Paul's message to the Philippians. That's his message from here to the end of the book. There is a greater reality. And no matter what you're enduring, remember Paul's writing from prison. Maybe his last few days. He's writing from prison. And he can say we can rejoice not because things aren't difficult or not because our problems aren't real or not because you know that, that all these things going on in our, in our life are insignificant. We can rejoice because there's a far greater reality. That's Paul's point from here on. I always go back to Psalm 27, verse 10. Psalm 27, verse 10 says this. My mother and my father have forsaken me, yet the Lord will take me in. That's one of the many places in Scripture that teach us that the Bible shows us that we live a life of two realities. All of our lives, there are two realities. There is a physical reality that you see and you experience. Though my mother and my father have forsaken me. Right? The psalm writer is saying, this is real. My, my mother and my father, they let me down. They've forsaken me. That's a physical reality. There's nothing unreal about that. The psalm writer sees it. He experiences it. He grieves for it. But then he goes on to say, but there's another reality. And that other reality is that the Lord will take me in. Scripture always presents to us these two realities. There's the physical reality and there's the spiritual reality. They're both real. Neither one of them are fake. One of them you see and you experience with your earthly senses. The other you experience by faith. Now, here's the thing. Whichever of those two realities dominates your thoughts, that will be the reality that shapes your emotions and shapes your life. You can take that to the bank. Whichever of those two realities dominates your thoughts, that will be the reality that shapes your emotions and they shape your life. If your thoughts are dominated by the physical reality, then that's what's going to shape your emotion. And as your physical reality improves, so will your emotions. As your physical reality uh, goes down, then so will your emotions. However, if what dominates your thoughts, if what dominates your heart if you worship by the Spirit, in other words, and the spiritual reality is what dominates your thoughts, that is what will dominate your emotions. That's what will control your emotions. And that doesn't change. That is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Jesus Christ is always the same, and our, our righteousness in Him will never change. And so if that is what dominates our thoughts, that is what controls our life. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Truth That Transforms with pastor and Bible teacher Jason Wilkerson. Truth That Transforms is the daily teaching broadcast of Disciples Fellowship Church. We invite you to visit our website where you will find more resources to help in your journey of discipleship. You can find us at www.disciplesfellowshipnc.com or connect with our Facebook page at Facebook slash Disciples Fellowship NC. Truth That Transforms exists to glorify Jesus Christ through the teaching of His sanctifying and disciple-making Word.